Hey, and welcome to the Easter edition of Airhex, uh, 13th edition, and it's Tuesday, not Monday, but it's an exception from the uh, rule. Uh, yesterday, uh, there was a vacation, so uh, that's the reason why we shifted to Tuesday. So, okay, uh, let's start with the very first question. Uh, number one, I have never used Spring, Hibernate, and Struts. I built my web apps using JSF, EGB, CDI, JPA, and uh, whether it's the same, I suppose, the question. What's the difference? And I would say it's a not a lot different between both. I get the question a lot, you know, what's the difference between Spring and Java? Um, if you would build the same with Struts, you would uh, spend up a little uh, Struts. Sorry, with Spring, you will spend a little bit more time with setup. So you will need, you know, to uh, configure the uh, server, you know, the, the Tomcat, Jetty, whatever, and uh, also your application. So you will have to wire everything with annotations or or uh, XML, but you will be more flexible. And um, Java e comes um, with everything out of the box. So hopefully you have just a war with one dependency and you're ready to go. So this is a more a philosophical question, what is better? I personally prefer um, Java e because there is nothing to set up. Having that said, Spring, uh, Spring Boot um, right now uh, uses a similar approach, uh, approach where you can, where you can have um, so-called profiles and these profiles can um, prescribe, you know, common amount of libraries, which is automatically downloaded and even bundled with the application. So it's very similar. So I think uh, what you are doing, you are using just Java E. And um, uh, by the way, is it the same? Usually it is. So funny enough, uh, if you if you are building a Spring application, you usually you will use exactly the same APIs as you as you use um, on the application server. I even wrote a um, blog post about this. You cannot escape Java, Java E because even with Spring, you will have probably used uh, JPA, um, JMS, for instance, if you have connectors, JCA. Uh, you could use JAXORES. There's alternative in Spring, but usually you, you're using some, uh, usually not EGBs. Um, JSF, you will have to use JSF if you like JSF. Um, so um, um, I think um, if you, it is, very hard to build pure Spring uh, applications without touching any Java e APIs. So this is, uh, I think, um, um, yeah, um, the, um, the right answer to the question. Um, someone asked me, do you follow any Java or software development related blogs? If so, would you share some with us? I'm actually uh, not following or reading RSS a lot. What I'm rather doing, I, um, I'm, I'm interested in particular topics and then I read whatever is associated with the topic. So, um, and then I choose another topic. This is what I, what I do. Um, the problem with, uh, with blogs, also my blog, you know, this is too diverse. So sometimes when author writes about, um, about, I don't know, a uh, baseball game and the other, other day about whatever, right? So this is the problem. But um, I would say the, um, the Oracle blogs are quite good actually. So uh, they, they are, what I actually like are technical, but I'm, I'm not subscribing to all the RSS feeds. Um, I lead, uh, I'm actually reading a lot of books, so um, whatever I find interesting, I just read it. So this is what I I'd prefer books over blogs, I would say. So question uh, number three again. JP821 has properties to drop and create the database, but not up to update it. How do you usually handle database schema updates and rollbacks? So usually I'm not using JP821. So what I'm usually doing, I'm using a tool which I prefer is called FlywayDB. And what this tool does is you have to um, record scripts, uh, update scripts, and there are just plain SQL scripts which are executed against the database. And these uh, scripts can be um, executed by uh, Jenkins. Or what are you? Or what you can also do? You can use startup singletons to um, to uh, fire up the scripts, and this works pretty well if the database is not too large, because sometimes all the table can takes can take even months, <laughs> not months, but actually one attendee of the Airhex uh, workshop in Munich told me it took two weeks in their case. So. Um, so, um, or if, you know, if the, in, in the development phase, I usually rely on uh, drop and create, but in the, um, in the um, production phase or update phase, I, um, I usually use a schema migration tools like, for instance, uh, FlywayDB. So uh, number four, for a multi-tenancy application, um, I'm using Java 7 and need to change schema dynamically based on customer. So I think not the schema, which has to, needs to be changed, but I think 
yeah, or schema or database, what, what has to be changed is the entity manager. Since there will be a lot of customers, um, of customers so multiple entity manager will be insufficient. Uh, so I'm using Hibernate Empty Interceptor along with Thread Local and changing schema dynamically, which is working fine. Um, so and and he asked about uh, a, a standard way to do this. So what I did recently as a proof of concept, I actually exposed an entity manager with producers. So um, I wish something like so. Let's do create a file. No worries here. Uh, entity come yeah entity manager exposer let's so and what you could of course do you could inject the entity manager manager here persistence context and entity manager and of course expose it directly and then you could be able to inject it whenever you like. So um, this is, you could use, of course, um, you could uh, use here qualifiers or you could uh, use depending on the client, on the injection point. And depending on the injection point, you can choose the entity manager here. And I think your um, number of schemas is not infinite. So uh, it will be also not an infinite uh, amount of entity managers and even you could configure the entity managers differently. So they could connect to a single database, but you could choose uh, different properties to set up them differently. And usually, yeah, this is how it could work, but you will need, you know, a setup data source per, per uh, database and you will need an entity manager per schema. And um, on the other side, so on the other side, let's say, um entity manager consumer em consumer you could inject the entity manager but you could use an instance so it will be dynamic and then in a method depending on, for instance, principle. So we can inject the principle here. We could do something like return, let's call that EMS, select, and then we can pass dynamically an instance of an annotation, which is going to be a qualifier. So we need a qualifier instance and, and pass it here. But then you could get you could get the right one. Then this could be dynamic. So depending on principle, let's say, so what we could create, we could create a um, qualifier and then uh, which is an annotation, then implement the annotation. So we get an instance. And then with that, we could uh, uh, select dynamic on the fly, the right entity manager. So this is a very dynamic approach. Um, but if, it's, if it doesn't have to be that dynamic, I would prefer, you know, just a very simple if else statement would also work very well okay so is that one so let's say what twitter is saying no nothing which is a good so um so you could do this absolutely and the next question is uh, what server with full java 7 support i would suggest payara or whitefly or liberty uh, exactly i would support these i wouldn't use glassfish i would i would suggest payara which is a um, commercial um, supported glassfish and the great story is if you for instance go to github um if you would go to github you would see a lot of uh to the to the payara and oh, that's just very slow payara You would see um, a very um, a very um, uh, nice page called Payara dot uh, Payara Home. This is this one, and um, and um, uh, these guys are are um, maintaining a commercial Glassfish branch, and with this um, 
Um, Glassfish is commercially supported by the company, so you can buy support, but it's actually Glassfish bits with patches, and all the patches are maintained on GitHub. So it's actually a nice story, and they're really, really active. Um, so this would be this question. So um, the next question is, um, in Java 7 web application, with a highly and dynamic configuration settings, uh, I think highly requirements uh, for configuration settings for the persistence here, what will be your way? No SQL on an entity abstraction layer like uh, Atlassian Jira um, Apache Office. So um, what, I, what I'm understanding here is uh, dynamic configuration settings is not about the connection settings rather than the schema, right? Because, um, because uh, that, I mean, you could, uh, whether there's no SQL or SQL, it doesn't matter. Each database needs certain IP addresses, port numbers, or whatever. And if the schema, or you would need something like fluid, fluid schema, schema, I would suggest actually a no SQL database, and which one entirely depends on the requirements. There are too many. But um, I mean, you could uh, look at um, something like uh, MongoDB is very popular, Cassandra, uh, Elasticsearch, and um, uh, even Oracle's KV store looks really interesting. Um, and um, and um, Apache Office is a little bit lesser known, so I would choose anything which is. I think I will I will consider a factor of the of the choice is popularity. The more popular a solution is, the more likely you will find answers in case something goes wrong. So, um, yes. So, f first, I, I don't get exactly what your requirements are. I understand that the schema changes frequently. Then I think this is not a very good idea to use SQL databases. Then NoSQL is the way to go. But it also implies you don't you won't have, you know, um, JPA entities, uh, where you will probably um, have to um, oh, um, oh, have to use this. Um, um, I would say uh, something like uh, map structures or um, or even um, uh, JSON objects. So the next question is um, your thoughts on Java extensions like Delta Spikes and Picketlink, as you always advocate Slim Wars. So uh, the one question is um, my thoughts on the extensions. So the first question is. Uh, what problem they solve for you? So, uh, what is now the the, uh, the 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 pain point, and what 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 this solution brings you? And uh, I actually was very happy without any extensions in my projects. But um, I know one project which used from Delta Spike. I think the um, type safe configuration in JSF, and very 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 happy about this. So, in such a case, just use it. But I always start without any extensions, any libraries, any dependencies. And uh, whatever we include in the war, it is really conscious deci decision and say, okay, um, if we take this, it will save us X you know, hours of work or, 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 or days of work. So this is why we choose it. Um, so, and uh, he also noticed, um, I also noticed that you are a member of GSR 375, Java Security. This is true. But um, uh, right now I was uh, too busy, so I have some a few dead deadlines next week, and then I will just be more active in two actually JSRs. One is Java security, and the other is management, which also interests me. And um, yeah, I will spend a little bit of time in both of them. Um, so um, and and what's about JSR three seven seven five? It is too early to say. But uh, the expert group member discuss right now, you know, um, uh, the the scope, and uh, I think it's all about usability and simplicity. So um, Java security has to be more more usable and uh, and easy to use. So um, someone asked me about uh, Onion architecture. So um, this is uh, question number seven. Having read about the so-called onion architecture as opposed to the traditional layered architecture, I'm wondering about how to realize that with Java E. The onion promotes an application core which is independent of libraries and infrastructure. With Java E POJOS, I have a feeling that we are already close to the onion idea, right? And he's actually very right. So um, let's say whether I find it onion architecture, uh, whether I will find the website. Where is the onion? No onions. 
So the onion architecture comes from domain-driven design, and the uh, main idea is that you have a core domain model and layers of extension. I think the first layer is like a repository layer, then you get business logic layer and exposure layer. And in Java E, is actually such an onion. In fact, in the recent um, Airhex Bootstrap workshop, is the very first one, I explained the Java E like, you know, POJOS with decorations. So the decorations were aspects, so it was more, were technical aspects. But um, if you think about this, the Entity Manager is already uh, a nice repository. So what you only need is to encapsulate the, the uh, 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 a little bit um, of the queries. So you have to encapsulate the queries. And uh, if you look on my, or my, this is actually old pattern, boundary control entity pattern, it is uh, very similar to the onion, but, but uh, a lot simpler. So you have the entities which are just plain poachers with behaviors, and you get uh, controls which are optional. There's just cross-cutting aspects and something reusable, and the boundary which exposes the component to the outside world. So it's like simplified onion, I, I would argue. And um, the question number eight, how you would implement RPC-like API between microservices using your Java E approach? Do you think that JaxRS can be used for that, especially with JaxRS client API? If not, what else could you be could be used in your opinion? So, um, absolutely. So, I th I think um, it is what you could do. So, f what for me JaxRS means is. Um, one-to-one -one mapping of your business idea, context, or whatever. And what you could do easily, I would just try to do this. I would create a class with the name uh, invocations, let's say, invocations uh, resource. And this invocation resource, I would just put a pass on it, would be invocations. And um, and uh, what it implies, what I'm doing here, I'm not modeling, you know, business clients uh, invoices. What I'm doing here, I'm modeling invocations. So, um, so what it actually means, I could actually ex um, use methods or invocations or actions, and use them as 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 resources. So uh, instead of modeling uh, clients or uh, or invoices um, or vacations, whatever, just use your methods, invocations, actions or a remote procedure call calls, so you call that calls, and with post invokes your methods, you can po uh, post whatever parameters you like, and with get, you could even introspect the uh, methods or actions, so you get uh, a really a nice, explorable, uh, self-describing uh, API for remote procedure calls, why not? So there's actually nothing uh, what prevents you to do this with JaxRS. And actually, um, several I do not even know whether they were attendees or uh, project members which did it, actually. They, they said, we need exactly this, and they implemented this. Okay, so then the next one. So why JNDI expose uh, uh, implementation bin name in global namespace? Why the caller must, must know the name of the bin standardized JNDI and so forth? So actually, um, it is um, exposed as a feature. And uh, it is feature because it is unique, but the caller does not absolutely doesn't have to know uh, uh, the name of the bean. Actually, in, in my code reviews, what I do, I look at the code. I'm searching for uh, JNDI a lookup, and this is in my eyes a defect. So in Java is five, six, and seven projects, there should be no JNDI lookups. You can just inject EJBs with straight at inject. So question number twelve. Um, what are recommended strategies for achieving zero downtime under continuous delivery principles? My team has a good pipeline in place for automated verification. Um, so from unit tests and so forth, so everything is covered and, and, and pretty simple. At the end of the pipe, though, we still have to take a downtime while the application is redeployed. This can range from one to five minutes, depending on the application. Our current Java contain container is Apache Tommy. Thank you. So actually, the natural cho what I what I'm doing um, I'm using Docker, so I'm preparing the whole image in Docker, so I know it runs, and then only have to start it. So it uh, wouldn't be I don't know one to five minutes. It would be um, usually faster, but let's say even one minute or thirty seconds is too too slow. What you would use then? You would of course launch uh, two exactly the same images um, on different ports, and configure and configure the load balancer. 
um, to uh, to use the, the first uh, the the server with the highest version, and I think this is called blue green deployment. So uh, you can switch between uh, applications back and forth. This is actually the idea, and um, yeah, this is what you can do. Or of course, without Docker, you can do this exactly the same. You can just uh, start on on your machine to Tommy's with different ports and the load balancer, like ModJK, for instance. This would works perfectly. This is a completely Docker unrelated. From Apache, could dispatch to one or to, to, to another, and you have no downtime. Usually, in larger companies, you uh, you would use um, hardware load balancers to, to achieve the same. So uh, the question number thirteen. Um, by the way, it's really interesting what the application sh uh, application is doing. Um, so um, I'm, I'm 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 performing right now some um, interviews on my blog about Java E startups. So. Jerin, I would be interested what you actually am building with Java. E. So uh, question number 13, do you think there's a value in having JDBC driver wrapper which populates its configuration parameters from JDBC, JDBC URL from a distributed configuration management system like ET, ETCD? So this is like, yeah, um, uh, like, yeah, distributed configuration system, uh, which has nothing to do with Java. It's just uh, uh, usually um, used a lot together with Docker. The idea being that a customer would stand st start up many instances of Java server probably through Docker and configure the database endpoints through ET etcd. So what I'm using, I for that you don't use etcd. What usually happen in Docker, what you would use is um, container links. So if you have, uh, for instance, and consider my blog exactly this blog. It runs on TommyX and and the um, backend uh, database uh, runs in different image and the uh, block image is linked to the database. So um, it, it, it knows the IP address, the port numbers, and whatever is needed to connect. Um, so this is how it works. And it even uh, Docker enhances ETC hosts for that purpose. So um, I think there is actually no, there's no magic. So it's actually, uh, in, in my case, there is, there, is, there is no Java infrastructure or Java infrastructure in place. So uh, the next question is, what is the best way to achieve a singleton JPA entity? Um, so um, basically, it's a longer question, but the, uh, the, 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 the basic idea is uh, he would like to have just only one instance of the entity and just go to database and achieve one. Actually, <laughs> fun enough, uh, two weeks ago, uh, someone asked me ex exactly the same question in the Rulewood project, and it was just fine. So what, what he did, there was just one row in the table and uh, the uh, row in the table um, was the configuration, and on the startup it just fetched uh, fetched the um, it just um, fetched the um, the uh, um, configuration and use it. So it, it would just work. Um, so what you could do is you start up Singleton to connect, fetch the configuration, and expose the JPA entity via CDI, for instance, would also perfectly work perfectly well. So this works. So uh, the f uh, the um, question number fifteen is JavaFX related, and uh, the question is: Are uh, cross view cross rectangle presenters something valuable? Do you ever miss that? So I think it is a little bit hard to explain, but uh, I think the main idea is the address pin would like to have A and B, and the payment be B and C, which is natural. So it's actually what what usually happens. And um, in uh, Afterburner, the framework, you should be achieved that, should be able to achieve that just by uh, using the uh, views and fetching the controllers without, uh, without dependency injection. And um, I'm just thinking about um, what's actually the, the challenge here, because what you could use e um, equally well in JavaFX just use um, includes and include the fxml files. It should work um, uh, perfectly as well. So there are different different uh, different strategies for this, and uh, the fxml uh, injection would work if you include the files. But if you have circular, circular inclusion, it could break. I never tried this, but uh, it could break. I never missed that. I have to say. Otherwise, I would I would implement something in Afterburner. Um, if if you have a concrete example, I, concrete I mean, you know, like, I don't know, uh, emails and inbox or something, 
um, I could I could think about this, but right now I was very happy. And the most um, most uh, complex example was actually light view from 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 Lightfish, and I have many views, and they are also cr cross referenced, but I never had a problem. So um, I had to even create the views dynamically, so so that dependence injection wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be the the way to go because it would be a singleton, and I w I wanted to have multiple views. Probably this is the problem. So if you would use this with Afterburner or, or Java E, you would get the same instance injected. But in, in, in UI, usually you will have two independent instances of B. Like for instance, in the light view, I remember there was like chart diagram. And what I wanted to have is multiple of the charts injected to one controller because one um, um, reported, I think, the um, performance of methods. The other one was number of exceptions or whatever, but basically was the same class and different instances of the same class with dependency injection wouldn't be possible but with uh with just plain instantiation it would work and what i also got some nice uh comments on my blog so there are just uh today uh questions about from uh from from uh, um um directly to my comments um, there's an old 10 years old application, J2, no EGBs, POJOS, transaction capabilities, web layer, hibernate version, and whatever. And he asked me to the to the stakeholders uh, how to argue with with them, whether it is worth you know to migrate the application or just kill it and restart from scratch. And I would say the only arguments I know is of course money. And in long term, uh, the most expensive stuff is of course, maintenance, but this is hard, you know, to 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 calculate. But usually, what uh, you should find, I think, is a weakness of your application. And 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 uh, usually nowadays, the weakness is the UI. Old applications are not responsive and don't do not work well, you know, on modern devices. So you should argue this this way probably and try to kill the application, and just um, um, rewriting that and and greatly simplify the design and the architecture. This is what I, what I would do. I think patching an old application could be really hard, particularly uh, the old applications are usually not very well tested. So um, this could be a problem. So um, someone asked me, you have to build dynamic web forms. The form exists as PDF templates, and now we have to produce dynamic web forms for a very single PDF content. We don't want to use the PDF inside the page. I think this scenario isn't very rare. It, I never had the problem, so it is uh, not very common, I would say. Um, what would be your approach nowadays? And I think there is a company called JPedal uh, or R e -R -D -S Solutions. Yes. And um, they, I think they are, have even Java E Solutions. So I, I met them at Java One one day, a nice, uh, nice company. And what they have, they are able to exactly to do this. This is a commercial product, but they can create forms from PDF. So look at um, idrsolutions.com or met them at Java One. I think usually they are there. So I, I, I saw them several times. So um, this. And the last question is, um, is um, a little bit harder to answer directly. In Java, is Java more secure and faster than Microsoft frameworks like ASP.NET and MVC? And which are the advantages of Java? Um, Faster and secure, no idea. I, I would say they, are, they they would be similar. And security is very subjective. I would say it really depends on operating system, whatever. Um, it's, it's really hard to say. But what are the advantages of Java E? I think the main advantage of Java e over everything is this JCP, Java Community Process, because um, all the AP, APIs have to be documented in PDF. Multiple, multiple vendors are involved. So what, for instance, happened is... Orki killed the uh, commercial support for Glassfish, and 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 many of my clients moved to Whitefly, and um, and without any major problems. Um, so this is, for instance, a huge, um, a huge um, uh, advantage. So, but if Microsoft will kill ASP.NET, uh, where you would like to move, right? To, to go, this is actually a, 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 a main difference and even in java we, we you could even migrate from java e to spring or from spring to java e or whatever in, in in microsoft there there is you know the whole ecosystem is one vendor and if you look at the history they change a lot in the past and with uh, i don't know they i think there there is no more how it's called um 
uh, uh, link for SQL was killed and several persistence frameworks were killed. And in Java E is the other problem is nothing is killed and gets a little bit more too complex, but you can rely on existing technology. This is the huge advantage. So I think the advantage is rather strategic from for Java E and um, and uh, .NET could be funnier for developers because because it mo moves faster, but uh, not that uh, that great for 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 larger companies because it moves faster and uh, you have no guarantee that an API will remain um, for a longer period of time, which is actually given and very common in Java. So I think we are out of questions, and um, see you at um, workshops in uh, Munich Airport and um, what um, the next one I think is HTML5 end of April and um, what I'm really curious about so this is actually uh, what uh, I did several times um, always a little bit modified but uh, this one is the uh, it's some some attendees uh, told me about this building Java apps from scratch and uh, what I'm going to do is just watch you uh, as you code and just try to fix your errors and uh, you will build the application and I will be you know the mentor or uh, the business department if you if you like and try to challenge you so this could be an um, interesting uh, workshop or uh, or a very dangerous uh, one for me if nothing will work right so um thank you for watching and see you in upcoming conferences um hopefully Java one I actually submitted some sessions um Java One uh, um, um, Airhex in Munich uh, next month here at uh, Airhex TV and uh, probably even projects. So thank you and bye.